I'm decorating some beakers today um, using our toolkit and I've been asked recently on several occasions about the toolkit and while I've talked about this in individual videos I thought I'd just sort of focus on the toolkit itself uh, for a while. Our prehistoric pottery toolkit has built up over quite a long period of time. Every time we get a new commission, it often involves going off and making new tools in order to fulfill that commission. And we base the tools on the marks on the pots. So when you're looking at the pots, you're looking at the marks that are on there, you're trying to work out exactly how they were made. And for instance, with beakers, um, you can often see the toothed comb uh, the type of teeth on the comb that have been used and the number of teeth on the comb because it's generally done in individual strokes. So when you're decorating a beaker like this, you're taking the tool and you're working round it by simply pressing into the surface with that comb and you're working one section at a time. And you can often work out where the overlaps are and in doing that, you can actually work out roughly how many teeth the, the comb had. Um, often you can see that the teeth dip away at each end and that implies that the uh, the edge of the comb was curved which makes absolute sense because it allows you to roll the decoration on there nice and neatly. Um, so I will generally make the tools that we've got with a curved edge. As far as I'm aware, we don't have any Bronze Age decorating combs from bigger culture. I might be wrong, there might be one in a museum somewhere that I haven't spotted, and if you spot it, please do email me, message me, tell me, I'm, I'd be fascinated to see it. Uh, what we do have is various tools from various time periods for various different crafts, and almost invariably they're made from things like bone and antler and shell and stone and wood uh, and horn indeed so we've got some horn here somewhere where we've got a bit of horn uh, there we go that's what i'm looking for um so the tools are made of natural materials and we stick with that because what we want is we want an effect that looks like the original and using the natural materials does that for us. When we're making combs we will often use a sharp piece of flint to cut the teeth. That's largely because by doing it with flint you are pushed into creating slightly unevenly spaced uh, teeth. Uh, it's quite hard work but at least you get the same sort of depth and things that they would on the original on the original the tools. Um, I often use bone, uh, I do sometimes use antler, sometimes I will use a piece of bone and this is one and the crisscrossing on here is based on some tools that are in Edinburgh Museum, not, not a decorating comb I will point out but uh, I think there are some weaving combs and things in there that you look at and you think yeah, you know if you're going to decorate your tools that would be a good way to do it. Again, with this one, with this one, it gives me a bit more grip on the surface when I'm working with it so that I can roll it on there. So combs made to fit the sorts of patterns that we get on there. And because each beaker differs, sometimes it will be extremely fine toothing, sometimes much coarser, sometimes very coarse. Um, we end up making tools with the same interval of teeth that you might have on the original pot. Other tools that we make for decorating Bronze Age pottery include these ones, which are uh, points that are used to make um, what you often find in sort of Irish influenced food vessels and things, what are called false relief. So a nice bone point will allow you to produce a very nice sort of zigzag decoration. But of course, Bronze Age potters tend to push that a bit further. They will go for doubling that up to produce again a nice double line and then to produce that false relief I was talking about, quite often come in behind that 
and decorating again behind there. So we've got a tool which will do all sorts of things. Of course, it can also be used to cut things. I mean, this is one of the things about these tools is that they weren't necessarily only for a single purpose. And people say to you, oh, what's that tool for? Well, in my case, it'll be because I'm trying to replicate a specific part, but often you might find that they've been used to do other jobs in producing the pots. And the sort of case in point for that, in point, um, is bone and antler points and wooden points indeed. So we've got all sorts of different points that I use um, because, of course, when you're doing grooved wear and things like that, being able to put in a nice smooth surface line is quite useful and I would tend to do it when the pot was a bit drier than this. This is a quite wet piece of clay um, but it allows me to put in quite a smooth line. Sometimes the lines that you find on those pots are quite roughly done so I might well use the, 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 the tool end on to produce a rougher surface line, a more v-shaped groove within the pot and sometimes of course you've got to be, you, you need the blade to be able to produce fine lines, things like that. But these would also have been used as spatulas. They're often termed as spatulas and you can use them for burnishing the surface of pots and things like that. So the points, very useful tools, do all sorts of jobs and we again make them up when we need them. Uh, Scrapers, very important, and sometimes the points and the scrapers cross over, I think. You know, you, you, you can have something that's got a, a point on there, but it can also be a scraper which allows you to smooth out the surface of your pot. So you've got a, you've got a tool which will do both. Um, mostly, I probably use um, stones. Stones are great scrapers, they really are. Uh, and when you get a favourite one, it will get used and used and used. And I don't know if you can see on there, but the edge of this has become a beautiful V, a beautiful uh, sharpened edge by simply using it to scrape on the outsides of pots when I'm working them. And of course, the curve on the inside allows me to scrape the inside. All of these processes allow me to smooth out the surface of the pots and that's what's happened to this beaker prior to getting it ready to decorate which I'll be carrying on doing in a little while. If you want a really fine surface of course you need to burnish and burnishing often will be done with something like a smooth stone. This is a beautiful beach pebble which is smooth enough to allow me to burnish the surface of that pot. Now, again, I would normally do this when the pot was considerably drier because burnishing works better when it's dry. But the stone's good, but I also use this quite a lot, which is a, a, a cow's toe, basically. Um, and it, so it's, it's effectively horn. Um, and again, it's got a nice big area that allows me to smooth out. But I also use bone and antler and all of these things get used in doing these processes. Um, scrapers for the inside of pots, well shells are great. Shells, shells work very well inside the pot. Impressed decoration that we looked at before with the points, you also get things like bird bone. The bird bone is a very popular decoration on uh, say things like Neolithic Peterborough ware, where it gets pressed in repeatedly, producing this sort of little butterfly pattern on there. Um, but also things like flint, flint itself. You, you will sometimes see cuts into the pot that when you look closely, you find that there are definitely flint uh, cuts. Maggots, probably my favorite tool. Um, whipped cord, so cord itself, often used on beakers, of course, to produce impressed cord decoration. And I sort of favor lime bast cord because it's hard, it, it gives a good solid cord that will repeatedly press in without getting soft and soggy. Um, but maggot marks, which have often been shown to be made with sort of elongated maggots like this, which you can do. Um, but I think in one of my videos, I probably explain why I prefer the ring. The ring fits on your finger nicely, but you can also use it to press in and it gives the perfect maggot mark that you find on the pots. Uh, sometimes if my finger's wearing out, I will attach that to the end of a stick 
and do this because quite frankly if you're doing a large vessel or a lot of vessels where you're repeatedly doing it your fingers do get quite sore so string cord that sort of thing work very well um the mat i'm working on is a, a grass mat and quite a few uh, grooveware vessels, particularly from Orkney and Scotland, have been found where the bottom of the pot shows that they've been made on a grass mat. And the grass mat itself becomes a tool because it allows you to rotate the pot and turn it round. So these are all great things. Basically, our toolkit builds up over time as we work through different things. We don't always know what the whole tool looked like, what we do know is we know what the working edge looks like because that we've got the impression in the pot and that is sufficient for us to design a tool and make a tool that will do the job that we need it to do. So I hope that's been helpful. Watch our videos, carry on watching our videos, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, you find us on other social media, look out for Potted History. Get lots and lots of information about the making of ancient pottery and of course visit our shop. What better place to get your Christmas and birthday presents than a nice replica from the pottedhistory.co.uk website. Thanks for watching.